Today we're out here in Western Colorado taking a look at the car you've all been asking about, the all-new 2020 Kia Telluride. This is the biggest Kia ever sold in the United States. This is actually about four inches longer than the ill-fated Borrego that Kia launched back in 2008. This is a seven-passenger or an eight-passenger crossover, and it's designed to compete very head-on with the largest crossovers in America, like the Atlas and the Traverse, really leaving the Sorento to compete with the smaller entries like the Highlander. Up front, we have the biggest, boldest front end of any Kia in America. You can see that we still have the tiger nose grille that we see in the rest of the Kia lineup, but it is a little bit different. It actually doesn't wrap completely around this grille area. Instead, we just have bars on the top and the bottom. We're driving the top end SX trim out here, which means that we do get the full LED headlamps. You will only find these in the top end SX trim. All the other models get regular halogen projector beams with a different turn signal arrangement. In this one, you can see that the ring around the light module acts as the turn signal. This is also the only model to get LED fog lamps down below. They're these twin modules on each side. Now, one thing that is standard up front in all trims is that radar sensor right there in the middle, because this is one of the first Kia products to get all of their latest active safety technologies standard in even the base model. The standard radar sensor up front gives all trims of the Telluride collision warning with autonomous braking and pedestrian detection, full speed range adaptive cruise control with stop and go. We then have a camera right here behind the windscreen that gives us lane keeping, lane centering as well. And then we have radar sensors in the back of the vehicle that give us cross traffic detection and blind spot warning. You will find all those features on even the base trim. In addition to that, rear parking sensors are also standard, front parking sensors are optional. Some folks over at facebook.com slash alexandautos were a little bit confused about where the Telluride slots into the overall landscape and where it fits into the Kia lineup. So let's talk about that now. This is 196.9 inches long. It's about eight inches shorter than a Chevy Traverse and still three inches shorter than a Mazda CX-9, but this is notably longer than a Kia Sorento. Now, like the Kia Sorento, the Telluride is extremely efficient at overall interior packaging. We have a very boxy profile and you'll notice very little space is wasted in bumper overhangs, both front and rear. That means that on the inside, we have 117.9 inches of combined legroom. That is third row plus second row plus first row. That's the best way to compare vehicles out there. That's really critical because when you compare this to a Mazda CX-9, this may be three inches shorter on the outside, but on the inside, we have eight inches more interior legroom and we have significantly more cargo room in the back. That means that even though this is about the same size as something like the Subaru Ascent, this actually competes with a very different set of competitors when you really start digging into the numbers. This is aimed very directly at the larger entries in this segment, like the Traverse, the Atlas, and the Pathfinder. And that's due to not just the boxy profile, but also the relatively short hood proportions, even though it is upright and boxy. By keeping it boxy, they've actually managed to make this look like a longer hood than it actually is. Out back, we definitely find a square profile, as you'd expect in a three-row crossover, because those third-row passengers and the cargo have to go somewhere. Since we're driving the top-end model, we have almost full LED tail lamps. They're right here on the side outside of the liftgate, but in here, we have the backup lights, and those are still incandescent bulbs. Now, you won't find these same tail lights on the base trims. We do find a slightly different variant. And the very base model does not have the dual exhaust tips over here on the passenger side. It has just one outlet. Towing capacity comes in at a healthy 5,000 pounds, regardless of which model of Telluride you get. Front wheel drive, all wheel drive, whatever trim you want. But an interesting twist is that in the upper trims, the EX and the SX trims, you can get an optional towing package, which gives us a load leveling rear suspension, something that we generally don't find in this category at all. Under the hood, there is just one engine option. It's a 3.8 liter V6 engine. Kia tells us that this is not the same 3.8 liter V6 that the brand used to use once upon a time in other vehicles. This is actually a new design based off of the Lambda 2 engine family, so it's fairly closely related to that old 3.8 and of course their existing 3.3 liter V6 as well. But this engine now has direct injection and can run on the Atkinson cycle. It's also mated to a new eight speed automatic transmission. That helps this get much better fuel economy than a number of entries in this segment. 21 miles per gallon in the all-wheel drive trim that we're driving here, 23 if you opt for front-wheel drive. That's two to three miles per gallon better than the Volkswagen Atlas and basically matches the Honda Pilot with their optional nine-speed. 
As I said, all-wheel drive is optional, and it's basically the same all-wheel drive system that we find under the hood of the Kia Sorento. It features a lock function that can fully lock the center coupling up to about 40 miles an hour or so. That actually makes this all-wheel drive system more capable than what we find under the Subaru Ascent. A nice touch under this hood that actually surprised me is how easy it is to get the air filter out here. There's actually just a little door and then the air filter unlocks. So if you're the uh, kind of DIYer out there, this is going to be an interesting handy touch. When it comes to front seat comfort, I'm going to give these seats 9 out of 10 points. I have to say that I was a tiny bit disappointed in the top end SX trim because we don't get four-way adjustable lumbar support like we do see in certain other new Kia models. Instead, we just get a two-way adjustable lumbar support in this particular model, but we do get a thigh cushion extension. We also get a passenger seat that doesn't have quite the same range of motion as the driver's seat. It does not have adjustable lumbar support, but the seat bottom cushion does adjust for tilt. We do have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion, so it should be pretty easy for shorter or taller drivers to find a good driving position. I really appreciate this thigh extension here. Hopping into the second row, I'm going to give these seats 10 out of 10 points. We are in the top end SX trim, which has second row seats that are captain's chairs. They have a pretty decent recline to them. We also have both seat heating and ventilation back here, which is a big surprise. You don't really find seat ventilation in the second row of any mainstream CUV. The other reason that we get such a high score back here is simply the room. We have 117.9 inches of combined legroom. That is front row plus second row plus third row in the back. That is just three tenths of an inch less than the absolutely enormous Lincoln Navigator and seven inches more than we find in a Chevy Tahoe or a short wheelbase Yukon. This is significantly more legroom combined than we find in the smaller entries in the segment like the Highlander, the Pilot, or Kia's own Sorento. Now, interestingly enough, as you work your way on up from the base model, we get seven seats or eight seats depending on the trim. The base is eight seats, the next trim level up the S trim, goes to a seven seat configuration, EX moves back to eight seats, and then SX, this model right here, moves back to a seven seat option. So two seats right here in the middle, and then three across the back. Getting in that third row is pretty easy because there is no console right here in the middle if you opt for the captain's chair option, but it is worth noting that none of the versions of Telluride allow you to keep a child seat latched into place and tilt and slide this seat forward. So you have only the option of sliding the seat forward in its rails right there and then trying to jump through this crack right here. Now, you can do this, but it's not quite as convenient as something like the Volkswagen Atlas. But again, it is doable. That legroom is really obvious when we hop back here into the third row, because if I adjust the seat very comfortably for me at six feet tall, I was sitting in the front seat, it was almost all the way back in its tracks, I can very comfortably sit in the second row seat with about two inches of legroom left, and you can see that I have about four inches of room between my knees and this second row seat back. Now, just as we find in most crossovers out there, or SUVs for that matter, this third row seat is fairly close to the ground. So you can see that my legs are a decent amount off the ground, but I, there is a little bit more room here to stretch out than in those smaller options. Overall headroom back here is fairly similar to what we see in the Chevy Traverse, meaning that if I lean back like this, then my head does touch the ceiling before it actually touches the headrest. But these rear seats would definitely be comfortable for teenagers as long as they're not terribly tall. The center seat belt right here comes out of the ceiling. That is definitely not my preference. However, it does tuck neatly out of the way when you're not using it. And this third row bench is definitely wider than what we see in the Highlander. So three people will definitely be more comfortable back here than they will in that smaller Toyota. Another nice touch back here is that third row passengers get air vents back here and we have USB charge ports. But just as you see in most third row crossovers, all the plastics back here are hard. The Telluride and the upcoming Hyundai Palisade are very close cousins, but the big difference between the two models can be found right back here behind the cargo hatch and in the third row, actually. We get a little bit more headroom in the Telluride because of its overall squarer profile and a little bit more cargo room back here as well, 21 cubic feet. That beats everything in this segment except the Chevy Traverse or minivans if you're comparing this to something along those lines. That means that I expect this to be able to carry about the same number of roller bags as the Traverse and the Volkswagen Atlas. That means that you can definitely fit a number of these 22 inch roller bags upright in this position and still close the lift gate. We also have a spare tire under the cargo area load floor, which is a touch that we don't find in every vehicle out there. If we lift up the cargo area load floor, we find even more storage space. This is how we get to that 21 cubic feet total. As you can see, it's definitely wide enough for these roller bags there, and it's almost deep enough to fit a 22 inch roller bag under other roller bags on top. I suspect that you might actually be able to shove one of these 22 inch roller bags all the way over there to one side 
actually stick a second one next to it and then put additional luggage on top. But again, you will find more cargo capacity in the average minivan. Moving to the inside, the SX trim that we're looking at has the suede headliner like we find in luxury vehicles and a dual moonroof option right here. One right there above the driver and front passenger's heads and then one right back there that goes to just about the third row passenger's knees. We find fixed height shoulder belts for the second row seats and then adjustable height shoulder belts and two-way adjustable headrests for the folks up front. There are three different seat coverings offered. Base models come with imitation leather. We then have real leather in the EX trim. And in the SX trim, we have the option of upgrading into the Napa leather upholstery that we're seeing here. The interior design definitely has a very premium feel to it overall. The doors have a high percentage of soft touch materials, but as you'd expect in a mainstream vehicle, some portions of the door like this section right here above the armrest that wraps around by that speaker grill is a hard plastic. And then of course we have harder plastics down at the bottom of the door by the bottle holders. Moving from the doors on over to the dashboard, we find the same blend of premium materials going on. We have a soft touch upper dashboard that has then been after stitched imitation wood trim, imitation metal trim, but both the wood and the metal are actually fairly believable. This actually has kind of an open pour finish to it. We then have harder plastics lower on the dashboard and then a moderately sized glove compartment over here. I suspect we would have troubles fitting a larger tablet computer inside. You'll find two different infotainment screens in this dashboard. This model has the 10 and a quarter inch infotainment screen that we find in the top two trims. The other models will have an eight inch touchscreen infotainment system, but all of them will feature smartphone integration like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto integration. This one also features the factory mapping interface. Below that screen, we have three large air vents right here. The center vent opens and closes independently of the outboard two vents. We then have some direct access buttons for that infotainment system. The engine start stop button over here on the left and then dual zone automatic climate control, which is available. You'll find the rear zone accessible by this button right here. And then we actually control the zone from the infotainment system right there above. Moving down from there, we find the controls for the heated or ventilated seats on either side of these large grab handles. And then a large storage cubby right here in the middle, which is where we find the USB input for the infotainment system, as well as two charge ports. We have a 12 volt charge port right there and a USB charge only port as well. There's definitely enough room in here to put those larger smartphones and still close the lid. Working our way back from there, we find Kia's pretty traditional shifter. It's a console design, drive is all the way back, manual mode over to the left right there. And then we have some large cup holders over here on the right side. You might be able to fit smaller juice boxes in this one up front or in other knickknacks, and then two large square cup holders right behind. We find the drive mode selector to the left of that. The drive mode selector changes the way the engine transmission and all wheel drive system behave. Smart mode chooses the mode that is best suited for your driving style at the moment. We then have sport, comfort, eco, and a snow mode right over there, along with a lock mode for the center coupling, which is fairly unique in this segment. The lock mode will permanently and completely lock the center coupling up to about 40 miles an hour. So you don't want to use this on a paved road surface. You only want to use it when the going gets a little bit trickier. Behind that, we have a button to completely disable the auto start stop system. Some of you might be really happy to see that. Auto brake hold, electric parking brake, button for the 360 degree camera system, and a button to turn on and off the parking sensors. The instrument cluster in this top end trim features a large central LCD. We get a smaller one if you get the base models. We then have Kia's pretty typical instrument cluster design right there. Zooming out from there, we find a steering wheel that is very similar to what we see in the Kia Sorento. It's a four spoke design with buttons on these two larger upper spokes. As I usually say, our final impressions on the Telluride will have to wait until we can get this back at sea level because on our way up to Telluride, we were well over 5,000 feet and altitude definitely has a huge impact on engine performance. I suspect that once we get this at home, we will probably be getting between 7.2 and 7.5 seconds zero to 60 based on the overall size of the vehicle, the weight and the power under the hood. Curb weight in the Telluride ranges from just over 4,100 pounds for the base, front wheel drive model to just over 4,350 pounds for the absolute top end trim, which is what we're driving right here. So this should logically be the slowest model of Telluride. The base trim would probably be the fastest and I expect the all wheel drive to have a slight advantage over the front wheel drive model because there's a decent amount of power going on under the hood. 
that definitely puts the Telluride right in the thick of things. This is actually a little bit lighter than the Atlas, the Pathfinder, or the CX-9, and overall curb weight is actually very similar to the Honda Pilot, which has considerably less room on the inside. All Telluride models get 245 width tires, but as you work your way on up to this top end SX trim, they change those tires out for Michelin tires of basically the same size. So they tell us that this is likely going to be the best handling model and things will get a little bit lower as we move on down the food chain. That means that in our 60 to zero braking test, I'm gonna go ahead and guess that this is gonna be right around 120 feet, so this should be fairly average for this segment. Something like a Mazda CX-9 is likely going to stop shorter than this because it has very, very wide tires for this segment, but this probably will stop about the same as the Kia Sorento, especially top end trim compared to top end trim. This is a little bit heavier and a little bit bigger than that Sorento, but it actually has wider tires, which are gonna help things out a little bit. When it comes to overall handling, I'm very impressed with the Telluride's road manners overall. This has definitely a solid feel to it out on the road. It reminds me a little bit of the Volkswagen product line. It has a solid, perhaps even Germanic feel to it. You'll definitely notice that the Pathfinder is an awful lot softer, both in the overall steering feel, the lack of connectivity to the road, and the body roll that we get in the corners. The Telluride is a very neat and tidy package. This definitely seems to drive a lot smaller than it actually is. And of course, remember that the Telluride isn't actually as long as something like a Chevy Traverse. Choosing the optional all-wheel drive system is going to have a positive impact on the way that the Telluride feels out on the road. When you're in a corner and you step on the throttle, you can really feel that the car is sending more power to the rear. It has a very, very stable feel to it. That stable feeling is aided by the fact that the Telluride sends a reasonable amount of power to the rear under a wide variety of circumstances. From a complete stop, when you're in a corner, if you're more aggressive on the throttle, regardless of speed, etc. It's also worth noting that even if you put the drive mode selector in eco mode, if you step on the throttle a little bit more, it is still going to be sending power to the rear. And it will also send power to the rear on aggressive starts as well. That's a little bit different than other competitors where in the eco mode, it actually will disconnect the rear axle almost entirely. I actually found that behavior a little bit unexpected because in our driving out here in Colorado, we've been on the road for over 200 miles. We've been averaging just over 24 miles per gallon. Now, most of our driving has been open highway driving like this, but we have been climbing up hills from Gateway, Colorado, all the way up to Telluride and then all the way back again. And that actually should have dropped our fuel economy score overall below the EPA. However, in real world driving, the Telluride appears to be quite efficient. That's thanks to this new 3.8 liter V6 under the hood, which is able to operate on the Atkinson cycle, which really helps improve overall fuel efficiency. Fuel economy hasn't been Kia's forte necessarily in the past, but they're really trying to change that with a line of new green vehicles, and interestingly enough, vehicles like this Telluride as well, because this definitely punches above its weight when it comes to overall fuel efficiency. When it comes to the overall ride score, the Telluride has done fairly well out here, even though the pavement that we've been driving on is less than perfect. Some of the smaller road imperfections definitely come through because this suspension is not as soft as what we find in the Ascent or in the Pathfinder, but the overall handling ability and overall feel definitely is improved as a result of the slightly firmer suspension. Kia has done a good job of sitting right on the fence in terms of the overall ride and suspension tuning in the Telluride, making it just sporty enough for a large three row crossover and just soft enough so that way you're not gonna knock your teeth out on a longer highway trip. This is definitely the kind of vehicle you could take on a long highway journey and not really have a problem. Although I will have to reserve judgment until I can get this at home and give it an official cabin noise score, I have to say that on the surface of things, this cabin does appear to be very competitive in terms of the overall sound level. We don't really get too much engine noise into the cabin, and what engine noise does come in is fairly pleasing. Overall, out on the road, the Telluride is definitely a solid competitor in this segment. And again, I'm really impressed with the way that the Telluride feels out on the road, because I had expected this to feel like a bigger vehicle. This actually drives neat and tidy, very much like that Mazda CX-9, which I think also drives smaller than it actually is. This definitely feels a little bit more like the category that the Sorento is in, the Highlander, the Pilot, the Sorento, etc., in terms of overall on-road feel, but we have the room on the inside that we don't even find in the Traverse. In fact, this cabin, again, has more room inside than we find in a Chevy Tahoe. Now to the nitty gritty. How much will one of these set you back? Well, the Telluride is going to start at $31,690, plus destination, and of course, plus options. 
That puts this between an entry like the Chevy Traverse, which is about $1,600 less, and below the Volkswagen Atlas, which is about $2,300 more if you want the V6 in that Volkswagen. The base model is very well equipped. The base trim, again, is the eight-seat form of the Telluride. We get manual air conditioning, but we do get a rear climate zone. We get leatherette seats as standard equipment, the eight-inch infotainment system with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, the active safety suite enabled by that radar sensor right there up front, 18-inch alloy wheels, 245 with tires, 5,000-pound towing capacity, and keyless entry and keyless go, even in that base trim. If you want all-wheel drive, that will add $2,000 to any trim of the Telluride. From the base model, the next trim up is the S trim at $33,990. That gets you the seven-seat interior arrangement, just like the model that we were driving, and 20-inch wheels like we were driving today as well. You'll also get the sunroof, the dual exhaust tips out back, power driver seat, heated front seats, and upgraded ambient lighting. The next step up from there is the EX trim, which is $37,090. That gets us the LED tail lamps that we saw on this model, but not the LED headlamps up front, interestingly enough. We also get acoustic glass on the side front windows, which helps reduce the overall wind noise in the cabin, real leather on the inside, rear sunshades, auto climate control, and the 10.2 inch infotainment system that we saw in this particular dashboard. That model returns to the eight seat configuration and it is the highest end trim that you can get an eight seat Telluride in. So if you want eight seats and you want some of the luxury features, this is where you're gonna have to stop. The top end trim is the SX model, which again is what we have been driving. 41,490 is where it starts. We get front parking sensors, the LED headlamps and LED fog lights, the dual sunroof that we saw in this model, seven inch LCD instrument cluster and the Harman Kardon audio system with the 360 degree camera system. Now, if you want to get the absolute top end Telluride, then you have to add the option package that's available that gives us the Napa leather, heads up display, second row ventilated seats and the heated steering wheel. If you want all of the options on your Telluride, it will top out at $46,680, which sounds like an awful lot for a Kia. However, that is significantly less expensive than many of its direct competitors. There have been some over $50,000 price points talked about online, but that includes aftermarket accessories or dealer installed accessories, not actually has as it comes out of the factory, which again, $46,680 plus destination is the top end price. That means that this price range is actually a little bit narrower than the Honda Pilot, which is smaller on the inside. That goes from $31,450 to $48,000. This is also significantly narrower than the Chevy Traverse, which does start less expensive than this, but will go right on up to $54,200 if you're not careful. Similarly, the Volkswagen Atlas starts about this price, but that's for the base two liter turbo engine. If you want a V6 or all wheel drive, it is going to cost you more than the Telluride. And if you get carried away with options on that Atlas, it'll be about two to $3,000 more expensive than this. The only entry in this larger three row crossover segment that is actually less expensive than this on the top end is the Nissan Pathfinder, which is definitely getting a little bit old, but it will top out at about $45,900. For our detailed comparison section, you will have to wait until we can get our hands on one of these for a complete week, but let's just run through the usual band of suspects here. Obviously, the most direct competitor for this is the upcoming Hyundai Palisade. The Palisade is a little bit less practical on the inside because we don't have quite as much third row room. We don't have quite as much cargo room in the back either. But I do think that the overall interior design in the Palisade is actually a little bit more to my taste. I really like the cream and navy blue combination interior we find in that particular model, and I like the overall interior styling. I do like this interior more than most entries in this group, but I think the Palisade has a very slight edge in the front seats. But this is going to be roomier in the back. Next up, we have the Honda Pilot, and I'm gonna to toss the Highlander right in there as well. Significantly more room going on in here, especially if you're gonna put three people across the back, or if you really wanna carry any luggage behind that third row, because if you're using the third row in the Pilot or the Highlander, you don't really have much space in the back. You certainly couldn't put any of those larger roller bags in there. In this vehicle, you can. That's very similar to what we see in the Chevy Traverse. It does have a slightly larger cargo area in the back than this, but the difference is not enormous. It is really just a cubic foot or so. But the Chevy Traverse doesn't have the same kind of legroom that we find in the Telluride, and it is going to be notably harder to park because it's significantly larger. I think in some ways the Atlas is the most direct competitor to the Telluride, and here the Atlas has a few advantages, most notably family friendliness. The second row seats in that Atlas, you can leave up to three child seats latched into place and still tilt and fold those seats forward to access the second row. 
In the Telluride, you're doing the same sort of dance that we see in the Subaru Ascent. You have to slide the second row forward and then try and squeeze yourself into the third row or climb through between those two captain's chairs. So this is going to be less practical for families, especially for families that have two children in child seats that are using latch anchors in the car. However, this is going to be a little bit less expensive than the Atlas, and it should be significantly more reliable as well. A lot of folks out there wanted me to compare this to the Subaru Ascent. I think that's actually a tricky comparison because this is significantly larger on the inside than the Ascent. On the outside, they're very similar in terms of overall dimension. So if you're looking for an Ascent, but you want a good value on something that has a lot more cargo room and a lot more passenger room on the inside, this is going to be an excellent upgrade. The Ascent is an excellent value, especially in its base trim, but as you work your way on up to the upper end trims, I love the interior of the Telluride more than the Ascent. The Ascent's interior doesn't feel quite as premium by the time you've gotten up to this $40,000 or $45,000 price point. It's also worth noting that if you're wanting to avoid a continuously variable transmission like we find in the Nissan or the Subaru, the Telluride is going to be a good option. And if you want to avoid a turbocharged engine like we find in the Volkswagen Atlas or in the Subaru, again, the Kia is going to be a good alternative. Fuel economy may not be quite as high as we find in the Subaru, but overall off-road ability might actually be better in the Telluride. We don't have quite the same kind of ground clearance that we find in the Subaru, but we actually have a more capable all-wheel drive system. This vehicle does feature a complete full lock of its center coupling, something that you actually cannot do in modern Subaru vehicles. Subaru has excellent software and it will send a lot of power to the rear axle, but it will never send quite as much as the Telluride. With all that out of the way, be sure and let me know what you think about this vehicle down there in the comment section below. And if you were shopping in this segment, which would you pick? Kia tells us that they expect most folks to get the S, EX, or SX trims. Not very many people are apparently going to be choosing the base trim in the Telluride. So keep that in mind when you tell me your comparisons down there in the comments section below. Also find us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos so you can see what we're driving this week, which will include the upcoming Mazda 3 sedan and hatchback, also in all-wheel drive. And of course, if you want to subscribe to this channel, you can click up there to that link at the top of your screen. I'll see you next week.